We have been in a series called Citizens. And in this series, we are discussing our dual citizenship, that if you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, you are a dual citizen. In other words, you are citizens of this wonderful and remarkable nation, and you are citizens of the kingdom of God. In fact, this last week, we got to celebrate how great our nation is. Anyone just thankful for our country and those who have paid the ultimate price? Yeah, it's amazing. Which I gotta say, I am loving 4th of July in Indiana. Uh, moving from Minnesota. Minnesota had really strict rules when it came to fireworks. You could get away with like a sparkler and a fountain. Here, like you can let off bombs. And uh, <laughs> what I just did a couple of days ago would have got me arrested in Minnesota. It was unbelievable. And uh, we are, we're, we're blessed to live in this wonderful nation. Our nation is not perfect. My goodness, there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, but I am proud to call this place home. And I am so proud of those who have paid the ultimate price and have served in the armed forces to provide these rights and freedoms. Can we show them some love? It's amazing. Absolutely. And I'm also proud to, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. And one of the great challenges for you and I as followers of Christ is learning to discern and navigate how do we engage in public life? How do we participate in society? You and I are not to, to live some reclusive life where we hunker down in isolation. No, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And we're supposed to add value and be peacemakers and those who bring about positive change. Yet how do we do that in a culture and a society that is always changing uh, yet remain anchored to convictions and timeless truths that never change. And one thing we established in week one is anytime you and I as followers of Christ choose Caesar over Christ, it's a miss. And anytime we allow our politics to trump our faith, it's a miss that there's a big distinction between a biblical worldview and a political worldview. And a political worldview views your faith through the lens of your politics or your patriotism. But a biblical worldview views your politics and your patriotism through the lens of your faith. And this is a tension uh, that every single one of us is going to experience in life. And in addition to choosing Caesar over Christ, I would say that as followers of Christ, anytime we choose culture over Christ, it's a miss. And I've stated before that anytime you and I marry the spirit of the age, eventually we will become a widow. That there's always going to be vogue ideologies and new philosophies and emerging idols within our world. And there's always gonna be some new idea that people jump onto and they gravitate to. And we live in times where things that are not biblical are now becoming permissible, in fact, even celebrated. And this creates a unique dynamic for you and I as followers of Christ. But here's the deal. We have to remind ourselves that just because something is permissible doesn't make it beneficial. Just because something is culturally acceptable doesn't make it morally right. And so we live anchored in the timeless truth of God's word that, yeah, ideology and philosophy and all the different things that circle about us and the tumultuous turbulence that we live within, well, these things have a shelf life, but the word of God has stood the test of time. Therefore, it is worth your time uh, to anchor your life uh, to these timeless truths and to learn to allow God to inform and cue you and on how you ought to live. And I think the challenge for us, and something that we all have to be careful or we develop a massive blind spot that becomes embarrassing, is it is really easy to look outside the four walls of the church and be like, well, it's them. It's this corrupt political culture that we live in. It's this corrupt system that we're surrounded by. It is this corrupt and wicked and evil and immoral culture. And it's really easy for us to begin playing the blame game, right? And I would say this, to blame, B-L-A-M-E, to blame is to be lame. It's just a lame way of living that courageous are those who look in the mirror and ask the question, God, is there anything you want to do in my life? Are there any adjustments or areas of improvement? 
And I don't know about you, but when I look in my mirror, I see a lot of opportunity for God to do some work, right? That there's still some work that can be done in every single one of us. And it's learning to uh, courageously look into those matters and take ownership. Uh, Because what do we say? Ownership separates the overwhelmed from the overcomers. It's just saying, God, if there's anything in my life, and I think much of scripture is an invitation uh, to use scripture as a mirror, which we all are familiar with Christians who use it as a mallet, running around and hammering people over the head with it. But God's like, but what would happen if you looked at it like a mirror and you were to examine your own life in terms of what does God desire for you and I who are following Jesus? And that is the heartbeat that is going to be woven in today's message. And we're gonna look at something the Apostle Paul said. Now, if you're new to church, the Apostle Paul once hated the church. So if you have disdain or ill feelings towards this, welcome to the party, you're in good company with Paul. Paul emerges on the scene as an adversary to the church. And then in some remarkable redemptive work of God, he becomes an advocate, an instrument used by God for the local church. And Paul would, you know, write all kinds of remarkable letters to churches that he planted and participated in. And once in 2 Corinthians chapter five, he makes this statement. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So Paul is anchored in this kingdom language. And Paul is saying, yeah, let's, let's stay with that. Jesus came referencing and inaugurating and promoting and preaching the kingdom. And as citizens of the kingdom, let's continue to hone our thinking along these lines. And he says, okay, we know we're citizens. Now think of it this way. We are ambassadors, which what is the handle? Anytime you change the metaphor, you change the imagination. God is so brilliant in his creativity and artistry of scripture that he's constantly placing before us metaphors and images that stretch our comprehension, stretch our understanding of his desire and his work within our life. And Paul says, yeah, you and I are ambassadors of Christ. Well, what's an ambassador? An ambassador is a representative of a homeland in a foreign land. And Paul's like, yeah, that's the idea. As followers of Christ, understand that life is here today, gone tomorrow, but a vapor, and this is not our eternal home. We are simply passing through. Paul is saying, understand that we are ambassadors of Christ, that we are representing God in a world that views his ways, his virtues, and his values as very foreign. And if you and I, are ambassadors of Christ, well, what does that make the local church? The embassy of heaven. It's a beautiful idea. Jesus once said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. Jesus told us to pray, to anticipate, to long, and to desire heaven on earth. And God's plan A, the local church, is the representative of that, the representation and the embassy of this kingdom. That when we gather weekly, something we should maybe consider as a community of faith is those who don't know God, Those who do not have a relationship with Christ, when they gather with us, they should get a taste of heaven, a glimpse of God and his kingdom and and his beautiful redemptive work within the world. And so if you're not a Christian, we pray that that is your experience. And know that if you're not a Christian, what we're gonna talk about today, you're off the hook on. As a church, we don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians, but we do expect Christians to act like Christians. And so this will be group therapy for us and you can just laugh at it. But the question when you come to a statement like this, Paul says, you and I are ambassadors of Christ. This would be one of those statements or quotes in the Bible that people, you know, just reference off the cuff. And sometimes we can take these things out of context, not knowing why were they said, to whom were they said, when were they said, Why was Paul writing these things? In what context and in what train of thought 
did Paul make this statement? Or here's another even bigger question. Why does God choose to include this in his library known as the Bible? That God inspired the writings of scripture, that he is the ultimate author. And God says, this is something that I want contained in this library that will be extended to the people of God throughout human history. Why was this conversation so important? Now, like I said, Paul was tied to all kinds of churches throughout the region of his day. What I love about Paul is he was a renegade for Christ. He was so bent on leading a rebellion against the rebellion. Paul looked at the world that he lived in. In fact, he looked at the things he himself participated in and he recognized these matters, these ways, these customs are in rebellion against a holy and righteous God. And he decided and he would encourage and inspire others to do the same. What would happen if we became a rebellion against the rebellion? What would happen if our convictions empowered us to live against the grain, to swim upstream, to be in the world, but not of the world? And so he would take on the hardest assignments. Paul would look at the region and think, where's the places of the greatest immorality? Where are the places run down by idolatry? Where are the places where there is no representation of God, the gospel, the local church? Where have they never even heard of Jesus or they're hostile or resistant to any mention of Christ? And Paul would say, oh, send me, I'll go. And I love people like Paul, people who have that, that bold, audacious faith to say, I'll step out and extend grace to those who don't know they need it and those who are resistant towards it. So Paul would do this. He would plant churches, he'd raise up leaders, and he'd move on to the next space, and he'd continue circling back, he'd write letters, he would stay in contact. And there's no question in Paul's journey, in his you know, ministry leadership you know, career, if you will, the most difficult assignment, the hardest church that Paul ever had to deal with was the church in Corinthians, uh, the church in Corinth that this church came with a lot of challenges. In fact, it exhausted Paul and came with a lot of personal pain for Paul and it pushed him to his personal limits. And what you find in the church in Corinth is one, they were surrounded by all kinds of wonky philosophy and ideology and there was a ton of immorality around them circling about. And that eventually began to make its way into the local church to where what happened was there began to be a rise of false teachers that started producing a very wonky theology. So Paul's having to address that. Simultaneously, there were toxic leaders within the church who were creating division and harboring dissension and slander and gossip and spreading false reports. And there's all these just tricky dynamics that Paul was having to deal with. Uh, again, there was, you know, this Emphasis, and they became overzealous on you know, doctrinal things, specifically the spiritual gifts. And so Paul is constantly trying to address these matters. One of the overarching themes of both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is unity. And Paul's saying, come on, like we're, we're breaking up here and we're taking on behaviors that are not honoring to God. And the challenge that Paul would face is these toxic leaders who were gaining influence in Corinth, they started aiming their efforts at discrediting Paul. And so the argument would be something like, hey, look at everything he's been through. This man has been shipwrecked. He has been imprisoned and arrested, flogged by the authorities. All the things that this guy has been through and all the trouble that he's been in, there's no way this guy is a man of God. And so Paul's writings are borderline comical because he is giving a refute to these false claims against his leadership. And one of the things that Paul does following suit with something that we see in Jesus is he's constantly flipping paradigms upside down. He's constantly saying, hey, th this kingdom is upside down and it's inside out. And so what you will read about in First and Second Corinthians is Paul will say, no, it, it, is, it is through sorrow that God brings about joy. 
It, it is through foolishness that God shames the wise. It, it is through death that God brings about life. It is in our weakness that he is made strong. It's, it's not what you would think. In many ways, it's upside down and it's inside out. And one of the paramount themes that is woven throughout the entire book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is this emphasis of grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation. In fact, in chapter two, Paul says this, I have forgiven. In other words, he's dealing with tension and there's some people who are harboring bitterness against other people within the church. And he's saying, guys, I've forgiven those individuals and I have forgiven you. And he says, in sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. Think of that statement. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Paul recognized, listen, guys, one of the greatest temptations, one of the most productive and effective strategies of the devil is to get people who have been marked by this radical grace to live unforgiving lives. Is there a greater oxymoron than an unforgiving Christian? Someone who says, I have been radically changed that this Jesus came, stepped into my shoes, died my death, and I didn't earn it, I didn't deserve it, but he extended remarkable life-altering grace to me, yet I'm going to withhold extending grace to someone else. And Paul says, yeah, the Christian who walks around harboring bitterness and holding on to unforgiveness is the person who has been duped and tricked by the devil. And what Paul is saying, in his writings is he saying, church in Corinth, there are people among you who claim to be followers of Christ, but they're not living in a way that is evident that they're actually following Christ. In fact, one of the, Paul's arguments would be, church in Corinth, one of the challenges that you have is you have counterfeit Christians and they're creating confusion within the local church. And so Paul is building this idea. Now, come to chapter five, watch where he picks up. He says, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. And I love this statement, it's comical. He says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. In other words, hey, if we seem really enthusiastic and passionate, like, wow, they're bold, it's just because we really love God. Uh, but if there's wisdom and logic and rationale in what we're saying, uh, it is our best attempt uh, to serve you well. And he says, for Christ's love, compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live, check out this statement, should no longer live for themselves. I mean, that's a big statement that those who are in Christ, they no longer live self-centered lives. They no longer are governed by selfish ambition. They no longer live for themselves but for him who died and for them and was raised again. Now, now Paul says a lot there. And, and Paul is saying one of the tricky things is, is we, we get tricked by those who masquerade and run around virtue signaling. And we have a hard time discerning the matters of the heart. And really what is the true motive behind some of the things that we see? And Paul saying, listen, we hope that what we are is not just plain to God. We hope that it's plain to you as well. Paul's basically saying to this church, guys, I'm just one faulty person trying to share with other faulty people the goodness of our God. And I love that. I relate to that. Don't get misled by a 36 inch platform that adds way too much varnish on an imperfect person. I'm just one beggar telling other beggars where I found the crumbs. There's not a single perfect person in here. And the person who can't laugh at something like that has a halo that's just too tight, right? Like we're all imperfect people. Not a single one of us is perfect, which I feel like I just popped someone's bubble, right? Paul's like, I just hope that what we are is just plain to you. We are just imperfect people 
following a perfect savior who has been radically good to us. And as a result of this, he says, now Christ's love compels us. That we are compelled by the love, the grace, the compassion, the empathy, the gentleness of Christ. Which means anytime you bump into a mean and cruel Christian, it should cause pause. Wait a second. It's the love of Christ that compels us. And Paul's saying, yeah, you have to understand this. Folks, when you give your life to Christ, and if you're not a Christian, just know this. If you surrender your life to God, which I pray you do, and you yield yourself fully to God's work in your life, you have to know that there are certain options that are no longer available to you. That following Christ, certain options are now off limits. So when you place your faith in Christ, it says, okay, I'm following him. Well, there are certain things that Christ will never lead you to. Christ will never lead you to deception. He will never lead you into a life of falsehood. Christ will never lead you to immorality. Christ will never lead you to cruelty. He'll never lead you to division and you know, divisiveness. He won't lead you to malice. He won't lead you to gossip or slander. He won't lead you to greed. He doesn't lead us to these things. That when you follow Christ, certain things are off limits now. And he says, Christ's love, it compels us. Other translations say, it controls us. Again, we don't take our cues from culture. We take our cues from Christ. And he makes this statement. He says, one died for all so that we might live for him. A, a, a simple way of understanding it is we now live for what Jesus died for. This is critical for you and I to understand. We live for what Jesus died for. Well, what did he die for? For the sins of humanity, to restore the brokenness in our world, to make things right in a world full of injustice, evil, and wickedness. He came and died for hope and redemption and joy and healing and peace. Meaning if those are the things he died for, those are the things we live for. We live for hope. We live for joy. We live for peace. We live for healing. We live for redemption. We live for the salvation of broken souls. We are compelled by Christ. And this is so critical for you and I to understand because the moment we stop taking our cues from Christ, it becomes pretty apparent who's actually following Jesus and who's not. And he makes that statement. He says, now that we are in Christ, we no longer live for ourselves. And something I've been pointing out in this series, and I'm, I'm bold in this, I'm confident in this, that our nation has been profoundly shaped, founded, and influenced by Judeo-Christian values. If you were to extract biblical instruction and biblical principle out of our nation, our country would be unrecognizable. I believe that. There has been a profound influence that the faith has had on our country. Now you have to flip that coin over and consider the other side of it. In the same way our faith has had influence over our country, is there any way that our country has had influence over our faith? And if you were to do a deep dive into church history, what you will discover is when, you know, the original pioneers and pilgrims came over to this new land, much of what they wanted to establish was anti the establishment of Europe. And it's policies and the social order of the day. And so they said, no, we are going to establish a way of life that is bent on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and independence. And there was this emphasis from day one on individualism, which in many ways, this has set our nation up for remarkable success. And in many ways, this has even empowered the church in really beautiful ways. But no solution in a faulty world is a perfect solution. There is a shadow to everything to some degree. And most will ask the question, well, how did we get to a point 
where in our nation, we develop such shallow cultural Christianity. That's what we're being exposed of right now. That for the longest time, Christians have represented the majority in our nation, but the question is, is if that's the case, why weren't we doing better? And what we're being exposed of is we lacked true substance and stature and spiritual maturity. And there's been a biblical illiteracy that has really tripped up the church. And, and the question becomes, well, how does some of this happen? And what happened is, is as our nation began to take shape and there was such a strong emphasis on individualism and autonomy and independence and self-ambition, well, that created a very unique expression of the local church that you don't see around the world. That our church in America doesn't look anything like the church in Europe and our parenting churches. And one of the biggest distinctions is we developed a frame of mind, whereas around the world, they ask the question, as a follower of Christ, what can I do for the church? We have flipped that. And in our culture, we ask, what can the church do for me? And so what happens, and this is not a dig on you, quite honestly, it's pastors like myself who have played into this nonsense. And so then we develop communities of faith that are built and comprised of consumers, not contributors. And Paul is saying, yeah, well, if you get into my writings and if you get into the gospel and God's desire for his people, you're gonna find that there are some things that this life with Christ runs against the grain of the growing obsession with individualism within our nation. And you just look at the next generation and what social media and technology and all things digital has done. It is widening the gap where in our world we are becoming more and more and more isolated and ostracized from the world around us. And Paul's saying, yeah, but if you're a follower of Christ, you don't approach life that way. If you're a follower of Christ, you do not live with this ambition to disconnect and to live a self-centered life. No, you recognize that God's work in your life is tied to God's work in someone else's life. So he goes on to say this. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. In other words, Paul's saying, Jesus was perfect. And there was a time we got it wrong about Jesus. And if we were wrong about Jesus, oh my goodness, what are the chances we might be wrong about other people? So maybe we should just take a deep breath and humble ourselves and just operate with a little bit more gentleness. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the, newest, uh, the new creation has come, the old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled to himself through Christ, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we're all new creations in Christ and now God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Check out this statement. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. In other words, he's like, the moment you become a Christian, you view people differently. You don't walk around casting judgment on people the way others do. No, no, no. You see the thumbprint of God and the Imago Dei and that they're created in the image and likeliness of God. And there's something in you that longs for everyone to experience the goodness and the redemptive work of God in and through their life. That God can save anybody anybody. And he says, in the same way, Christ did not count sins. He, he didn't hold over people's heads, but he came paying the ultimate price. I mean, oh my goodness. Anyone thankful that he did that? Oh my goodness. You and I would be eternally doomed, lost without a cause, no hope. 
If Jesus doesn't show up and pay a price that we can't afford, you and I are doomed. And he did so while we were yet sinners. And he says, and, okay, and those of us who have been marked by this grace, it says, Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So if you're a follower of Christ, you should know you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So my question for you is how are you doing? What do your efforts look like? How much do you focus and participate on restoring broken relationships? How much do you focus on living with an open heart and extending grace to those who need it? Oh my goodness. Folks, what Paul is saying is would you just go through life and would you respond to other people's brokenness in the same way you are praying people respond to your brokenness? And would you just, hey, life is tough. We're all going through it. Folks, that's the thing. Life is hard. Come on, wave at me if you've discovered that. Marriage is difficult at times. Raising children is difficult. Managing a career, living within this culture, dealing with physical illnesses, financial struggles. Life comes with challenges. It's hard. And Paul's saying, yeah. So as siblings in this family of God, what would it look like if we didn't make things harder on each other? And we leaned in and linked arms and we sought to encourage and serve and uplift one another. He says, you've been given the ministry. And then he even clarifies it. He says, and Christ has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God is such a good parent. Ever like commit your kids to things that they didn't want to sign up for? It's like, oh, you're going to love it. God's like, I'm going to commit you to the message of reconciliation. And what is the message of reconciliation? You can be reconciled to God despite anything you've ever done. That's the message. But what has our message become? You can be reconciled to God despite anything you've ever done but you can't be reconciled to me because of what you've done. And oh, the hypocrisy. I mean, I feel like we owe the world a public service announcement. The church is oftentimes looking for the world to apologize to us and at some point we need to apologize to the world. Hey world, we're sorry that when the world needed the church, we responded with judgment and hatred and cruelty and we didn't just extend our open arms to broken people who need to be reconciled to God. And he says he has committed this to us. Other translations will say entrusted, but the Greek word there, is tith amy, which means to place under control. And you actually find this same language in the parable of the talents. Jesus says, hey, the, the kingdom of God is like a master who divvies up his you know, possessions and he gives one servant five talents and another servant two talents and another servant one talent. And it says he goes away for a while and then he comes back and he says, hey, what did you do with what I placed under your control? And the first servant's like, man, I, I've been fruitful. I've been diligent. I invested it. I was able to multiply it. And he's like, well done. And he goes to the next servant and he says, what did you do with what I placed under your control? He said, I did the same thing. I was fruitful and I multiplied it and I was intentional and I was diligent. And then he goes to the third servant and he says, what did you do? And he says, I didn't do anything. I just hid it. And Jesus makes some of his most un uncomfortable statements in response to that guy's play it safe approach. And there's gonna come a point where Christ is gonna ask every single one of us, what did you do with the message and the ministry of reconciliation that I placed under your control? And it is in this context 
that Paul then says, therefore, we are ambassadors, representatives of a king and a God and a Lord whose heart is enormous for the world. And we seek reconciliation and mending the brokenness in our world. Now, I just want to read to you how Paul ends his argument. In chapter six, Paul just, this is just where he ends when talking this thought with the the church in Corinth. He says this. Let's go to chapter six. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. In other words, don't say you're a recipient of this grace and not live as though it's true in your life. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's paths so that our ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, will not be discredited. Now watch what he says. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speaking and in the power of God with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, through bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you. But you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. he's, He's speaking to a church in turmoil and he's like, we're not withholding our affection. Would you open your heart also? And again, Paul's saying, when the siblings that are part of the family of God live with wide open hearts and love and they don't withhold affection to each other, God's like, yeah. That's how God makes his appeal to the world. That the rest of the world looks in on the faith community and they're like, oh my goodness, life is hard. How great would it be to be a part of a community and a family like that? And so church, let us seize the moment to be ambassadors and steward well the ministry and the message of reconciliation. And despite whatever we face and despite anything we go through, the hardships, the trials, the sleepless nights, let us maintain open hearts to a broken world who desperately needs the love of God. Amen? Amen.